everyone, and welcome to Module 3, in which we're going to begin talking about carbohydrate metabolism. So in our last lecture, we ended um, with carbohydrate absorption into the hepatic portal vein. And so this is where our glucose is going to our liver. And of course, we also know that glucose is distributed in our blood across our body in order to meet the energy needs all across our body. Now, next week, we're going to start talking about what happens when we break this glucose down for energy or talk about oxidation. But today, we're going to talk about what happens when we build this glucose up in order to store it. So we're going to talk about glycogen metabolism and glycogen storage diseases. Oh, I'm, I should say, I don't think my webcam is working today, so um, this will just be an audio lecture. So we're going to discuss both glycogenesis and glycogenolysis, or the synthesis or degradation of glycogen. We're also going to explain the regulation of some of the key enzymes in these processes, glycogen synthase and glycogen phosphorylase, and we're going to discuss the glycogen storage diseases. So we all know what glycogen is, right? It's many glucose molecules put together in a storage form of very um, highly complex branched um, structure. So um, we know that glycogen can um, hold many, many, many glucose molecules and is the principal storage form of glucose. Um, glycogen has primarily two kinds of bonds between the glucose molecules. We know that um, in these linear linkages, here, it's an alpha-1-4 linkage, and at this branch point, it's an alpha-1-6 linkage. Glycogen is found primarily in the liver and muscle cells, and the purpose of it is, just like we said, to be a storage form of glucose so that um, when the body needs glucose, the, it is able to cleave these individual glucose molecules off of the glycogen in order to serve as like a ready available um, energy source. And the glycogen that we store in our liver is considered the main buffer of blood glucose levels because we are able to cleave off the glucose molecules in the liver glycogen and then those glucose um, can be distributed in the bloodstream to different parts of the body. However, the um, glycogen that we have in skeletal muscles um, it's still important for the same reasons. We can still cleave the glucose um, molecules off of it for energy, but those glucose molecules cannot go in to serve um, as an energy source in different places in the body uh, because of the lack of an enzyme that we have in the muscle cells. And we'll talk more about this. But because of that, um, the glucose that we cleave in the muscle cells stays in the form of glucose 6-phosphate. And because we don't have this glucose 6-phosphatase enzyme, then it's not able to get out of the cell and therefore stays in the muscle cell to serve as an energy source for that muscle. Now, let's talk about why is glycogen important. It's important because it's made up of glucose, right? And it allows our body to have a constant source of glucose because we've stored it and we can utilize it when we need it. Now, why is glucose important? Um, because many of our um, body parts rely heavily on glucose, especially our brain. So our brain actually is a 75% of the glucose consumption um, during the day, and the remainder is used by our red blood cells, which can only use glucose for energy and, and, and skeletal and heart muscles. Um, the body is able to um, get glucose directly from the diet, obviously, or we can make glucose from um, other macro parts of other macronutrients such as amino acids, and this is called gluconeogenesis. Um, but um, once we have this glucose, what can we do with it? We need to store it so that we have it um, when we need it. Now, glycogen is um, stored in the most concentrated form in the liver, so that 10% of liver's weight is actually glycogen. But though it's less concentrated in the muscle, we have so much more muscle mass compared to our liver mass that really we store by quantity much more glycogen in our muscles. And the glycogen in the liver and the muscles serve different purposes and are regulated differently as well. Okay, so first we're going to talk about glycogenesis. So we have these individual glucose molecules in our hepatocytes or in our bloodstream 
and our body is saying, okay, we've got extra right now, so let's store some of this. Let's build some glycogen. And we're going to go step by step on um, how the biological process to do this. So in the first process we've got, or in the first step of the process, we've got our glucose molecule. We know that. We got that from our diet. It was absorbed through the enterocyte, and it went into our liver. And then in this first step, glucose is um, um, converted to glucose 6-phosphate by the enzymes either glucokinase in the liver or hexokinase in the muscle. And this really makes sense because we would say glucose goes to glucose 6-phosphate. So we added a phosphate group. And when we look at these enzymes, they're both kinases. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, so glucose to G6, to, I'll call it G6P, but it's glucose 6-phosphate. That step is the first step in building a glycogen, uh, or um, in uh, glycogenesis, but it's also the first step in glycolysis. So the first step is the same in both of these important uh, processes involving glucose. Okay, and the glucose comes from different places depending on where we're looking. So um, for the most part in the muscle, we build glycogen with glucose that has come from our bloodstream. Um, in our liver, yes, we do also build glycogen from um, glucose that we get directly from our diet, but we also get a significant portion of glucose um, in the liver from gluconeogenesis um, that our body has made glucose from either lactate or amino acids. And this first step uses one ATP. And again, that's easy to identify because we know that we're adding a phosphate group on, so we need the ATP to get the source of this phosphate group, and we end up with the G6 phosphate, or glucose 6-phosphate and an ADP. So that took up one uh, ATP. Next, let's go to, so, so then we're left with our G, um, glucose 6-phosphate, and in reaction 2, that's transformed to glucose 1-phosphate, and that just means that the phosphate was moved to a different carbon, and our enzyme is phosphoglucomutase, and that kind of makes sense, right? We're mutating it. We're moving the phosphate from one to another. Is that in this one? Okay, and this, it might, you might be a little confused by this because the G, uh, glucose 1-phosphate is on this side, but you can see it's reversible. So here you can see the only difference is that the phosphate is on a different carbon on here versus on the glucose 1-phosphate. Okay, and then we go to reaction 3. And reaction 3, we have our G1P and we have our UTP, okay? So this is uracil triphosphate. We're used to ATP right? Adenosine triphosphate. But this can be considered um, as kind of a, a parallel to ATP, you could say. So UTP um, can still be degraded to UDP um, by taking a phosphate off. But if you think about it, you can think of it kind of as an ATP or requiring energy because that UTP, if it goes to UDP, um, still needs uh, that other phosphate um, to go back to UTP. So it has used up, a, um, uh, it has broken this bond and used energy in this step as well. Now we talk about that many of these reactions are reversible, but reaction three is actually made essentially irreversible because um, our bodies uh, uh, hydrolyze this uh, two phosphates here into two molecules of organic phosphate. So then it makes it less likely that we have this molecule that um, can drive the reaction this way. So this one is made um, virtually irreversible. So here you can see our product here now is UDP glucose plus two organic phosphates. And then in our last reaction, reaction four, here we have our UDP glucose from the prior step. And that's going to be added on to an all uh, glycogen molecule that's already been going. And then we just depict this as glucose um, with an N subscript because we would say that's just could be any number of glucoses in a glycogen molecule. So we're going to add this UDP glucose onto this glucogen, uh, glycogen molecule with this important enzyme. This is one that you should remember, glycogen synthase, glycogen synthase.
And in this way, the glucose from the UGP is able to add on to this glycogen molecule. So you can see we, had, we have the addition of one glucose molecule, and then the UGP is left. So we said that in reaction one, um, in reaction three, we, sorry, this should be reaction three. Sorry, I'll try to fix that. Um, we each use, um, each use uh, ATP. So in total, in order to add a glucose molecule onto a glycogen molecule that already exists, takes up two ATP. Okay, so glycogen synthase um, allows for the addition of glucose molecules with alpha-1-4 linkages. But that doesn't really do anything for us when we're talking about glycogen, which is a highly branched um, uh, highly branched uh, molecule, basically. So if we just were able to add on with alpha-1-4 linkages, we would have um, just one line of glucose. And we know that we need it to be more concentrated than that. So we need this branching. And in order to get the branching and glycogenesis, we need what's called a branching enzyme. So this branching enzyme, you can just call it branching enzyme, that's fine, but it's technically 1,4-alpha-glucon um, branching enzyme. And what this enzyme does is it catalyzes the transfer of um, oligosaccharide chains from one end of the chain that we've been building with the glycogen synthase, and then it transfers it to an interior glucose with an alpha-1,6 bond. And I do have a couple of graphics, so this is just the text form of it. Well, I'll show you an example. So it's going to take one um, oligosaccharide, remember I think those are uh, three to nine glucose units long, and it's going to transfer it from the end of the glucose chain that it's been forming and put it on interior glucose with an alpha-1,6 bond. And then both of those branches are going to elongate until they get new branches. Oh, sorry, both of those branches will elongate with glycogen synthase until they're long enough to get new branches and uh, with the, and they'll need this branching enzyme. And why do we want branching? Well, basically, because when we have branching, we have many, 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 many different ends by which we can cleave these glucoses off of the ends of. So if we just had one string of glucose and our body needed glucose, it'd be a pretty slow process as we cleave one uh, glucose at a time off of that one chain. But when we have branches, we can cleave glucose off of all of these different chains at the same time, and therefore our body has an uh, uh, increased capacity to address um, changing glucose levels, or in this case, hypoglycemia. So here's one graphic. So here we have our glycogen core. We'll talk more about that. But then we have our glycogen synthase added all of these um, additional glucose molecules on, okay? Uh, with alpha-1,4 linkages, and then we have our glycogen branching enzyme, and you can see the branching enzyme is taking all of uh, these glu this glucose uh, segment, this oligosaccharide segment, and it's putting it on this interior glucose with an alpha-1,6 branch point. And remember, they said that then this will get long enough, and then um, we'll have to cleave off the end and put it as another branch point. So here's a nice um, illustration from your textbook of um, how we add glucose on, or how we um, have glycogenesis. So here we have part of a glycogen molecule, and remember, we're going to go back to how we even get this thing started, but if for this reaction, we have part of a glycogen molecule, we have our UDP glucose um, from the reactions that we talked about earlier, glycogen synthase adds the glucose um, molecules one at a time in these alpha-1,4 linkages. So you can see we're making it longer, 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 this branch. The UDP goes, and we're left with this branch, but this is getting really, really long. So our body's saying, okay, we need to make a new branch. And in that way, then we um, utilize the branching enzyme, and it transfers this oligosaccharide segment on to a different part of the uh, glucose chain in order to introduce a new branch. All of those reactions that we just talked about, um, we already had a glycogen molecule. We already had a glycogen core, and we were just adding a glucose on. So how do we even get this reaction started? Well, in order to get the reaction started, we need a primer. And that is required for the attachment of the first glucose molecule to begin a new glycogen molecule. 
And this primer is called glycogenin. And this is a protein um, that is located at the core of the glycogen molecules because it's the primer. It's the thing that kind of starts everything off. Um, here. Um, it does catalyze its own glycosylation. Um, so, so it has kind of this auto glycosylation in which um, uh, the is it a serine protein residue in the glycogen molecule um, is able to attach a glucose residue from a UT, UDP glucose. And then um, glycogen synthase then forms a compound with this glucose bound to the glycogenin. And, um, and then this polysaccharide chain is autocatalyzed by uh, transferase activity until it reaches a certain number of glucose molecules long, and then we have our um, branch point started. So, sorry, that kind of got a little complicated. But the take home message is you need the primer glycogenin. It catalyzes its own glycosylation or addition of a glucose um, onto that uh, protein, glycogenin, and then gluc glycogen synthase is able to take over and start the process that we just talked about where it's adding these 1,4 linkages and then ultimately the branching enzyme is adding on branches. So here's just a graphic of that, that we have our glycogenin, we have the glucose um, attached onto the tyrosine of, or maybe it's what it said serine, it doesn't really matter in the last graphic, but um, the glucose attaches on, and this is what we call our primed glycogenin, and then um, our primed glycogenin um, encounters glycogen synthase and the branching enzymes so that we are starting to build our glycogen molecule. And then here's kind of this whole process that I just talked about from start to finish, um, though I added a couple of little things here to kind of give us a bigger picture. So let's walk through this really quick. So we have our glucose, right, in our liver or in our bloodstream, and we, we already said we use 1 ATP in the first step in order to add a phosphate group onto glucose. Then with phosphoglucomutase, we move that phosphate group, so it's glucose 1-phosphate. We then, with UDP glucose phosphorylase, add this UTP on. Um, so if you think about it, this had 1-phosphate and then... Um, uh, three phosphates here, and then we get rid of two, so we're kind of left with two, UDP glucose. So here we have the addition of the UTP or the UDP, which ultimately becomes UDP glucose. And then with glycogen synthase, it takes the glucose off of this UDP glucose and adds it to the growing um, chain of 1,4 linkages. And then, of course, we also have our um, branching enzyme here that adds the branches on so that we end up with a glycogen molecule. And you can see that with the glycogen synthase, when we add the glucose on, we have the UDP left. And it's, this UDP kind of needs to be recharged, if you will, by ATP so that it can um, uh, be involved in this reaction here again. Um, so really, in total, we use two ATP. And just a couple of the little things I've added so we can get a picture is that when we go from glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, yes, we can use this to build a glycogen molecule, but we can also use it um, and go towards glycolysis. Um, and then also I have our glycogen molecule here and have that we need to um, have a glycogen primer in order to even start a glycogen molecule. So we've said that glycogen synthase is really the um, the premier enzyme, I guess, in glycogenesis. It's what adds the glucose uh, molecules onto the growing glycogen um, complex. So this is going to start getting a little tricky, and I think this kind of conversation is going to become more familiar as we go throughout the semester. But if it sounds a little confusing to start, <laughs> that's because it is. And I think, um, you know, you can go through your text pretty slowly, and they explain this too. So if you're having trouble, go back to the text or re-listen to this but I will do my best to keep it as simple and clear as possible. So, and also, um, as I walk through the text on some of these, realize I will have graphics to help explain it as well. So, uh, here I have glycogen synthase as GS, and glycogen synthase is present in the cell in two forms, okay? The active form and the inactive form. 
And we talked about in prior um, discussions that what really um, distinguishes an active form from an inactive form is whether it is phosphorylated or not. Does it have that phosphate group on it? That's what will make it active or inactive. And depending on what enzyme it is, the active form could be the dephosphorylated form or the active form could be the phosphorylated form. So you just have to kind of keep it straight for um, all the different kinds of enzymes. So for glycogen synthase, for this enzyme, the active form happens to be the dephosphorylated form. And the inactive form is phosphorylated. So remember, when we're phosphorylating something, we typically do it with a kinase enzyme, okay? So if it's in its active form, it needs to encounter a kinase enzyme in order to get it to its inactive form. And vice versa. If it's in its inactive form, it has a phosphate group, so we would need a phosphatase to take it off um, and get it into its active form. So, um, so as we talked about, we have to get these kind of chemical signals in order to make these enzymes work. And one of the primary hormones that we need in order to promote glycogen synthesis is insulin. And that makes a lot of sense, right? So when does insulin come out? It comes out, or it's secreted, I should say, or excreted, um, when we have high blood glucose. So the body's saying, hey, I've got plenty of glucose now, help me store it. So, um, so that is what the insulin is doing. It's signaling your body to help store it. So it's synthesizing glycogen, synthesizing the storage of glucose. And glycogen synthase can serve as a substrate for a number of protein kinases. So you can see that this one enzyme can, um, can I should say, dock or land or um, catalyze um, all different kinds of kinase enzymes. And so if you think about that, if it's enabling all of these kinase enzymes, then what do those kinase enzymes do? They are putting a phosphate on different enzymes and they're kind of having this cascade. They can have these long ranging effects because uh, glycogen synthase can serve as a substrate for so many different protein kinases. And the uh, first and foremost, um, camp dependent protein kinase A. So we talked about that, right? We talked about that um, uh, we can have these secondary mes second messenger systems in which a hormone will stimulate camp and then camp will stimulate a, pro a specific kinase. And again, we'll see this in a figure. Okay, and then this last point is just that various protein kinases are activated by different signal transduction pathways. So um, kinases may respond to, so we could have one hormone that affects many different kinases and then therefore has many different responses in the cell, or you could have um, specific kinases that are affected by many different hormone or nutrient signals. So it can go both ways. It's very specific, but kind of flexible when you think about it that way. So here's just a brief list of the protein kinases that can phosphorylate glycogen synthase. So remember, if we're phosphorylating glycogen synthase, we're making it less active. So some of these kinases are phosphorylase kinase, which is involved in that kind of this cascade with protein kinase A, um, calmodulin dependent protein kinase, which is um, mostly in the muscle cells and it's regulated by calcium binding and protein kinase C. So all of these kinases can add this phosphate group onto the active form of glycogen synthase in order to uh, change it into its inactive form. Okay, and it's really, um, so we talk about um, how the body is when we talk about chemical messengers, remember one of the last characteristics of it is that the um, signal ceases at some point. So basically when the body says, okay, um, I sent out these signals, I got what I wanted, then we have that negative feedback in which we're able to say, okay, let's stop, let's stop these biological processes. So for glycogen synthase, one of these signals is camp concentrations. So um, 
we know that if we can change camp concentrations, then we can change the activation of the kinases that might um, inactivate glycogen synthase and uh, consequently glycogen phosphorylation. Now we can also go the other way, right? So we just talked about going from the active form to the inactive form, but now what about when we have this inactive form and we want to go to the active form? Well, we know to put a phosphate group on, it takes a kinase, but when we're going from this um, phosphorylated form to the dephosphorylated form, we got to take off a phosphate. So that requires a phosphatase. And in this case, that's phosphoprotein phosphatase. <laughs> There's um, quite some uh, interesting terms in this top, in this, uh, in macro. So um, we're going to look at a graphic in the next slide. But basically, we have phosphoprotein phosphatase that's going to help us bring us back to our active form of glycogen synthase. And that enzyme is regulated by another enzyme called the inhibitor, uh, inhibitor 1. And that is found um, especially in the skeletal muscle. So basically, let's kind of take a step back. We talked about our body, um, for instance, is... Um, so we talked about insulin, but let's talk about glucagon. So our body's saying, I have really low um, glucose levels, um, so I'm going to release this glucagon. And then that glucagon um, activates adenylcyclase, which catalyzes our camp synthesis. Think back to week one when we went through all of that second messenger system. Um, and so it, it would be glucagon and hepatocytes, but epinephrine would do the same thing in the myocytes or the muscle cells. And once we have our camp, it's going to activate protein kinase. And what does the kinase do? It adds a phosphate group onto um, glycogen synthase and inactivates it. So let's think about this as a process. Does that make sense? If I have glucagon, because I have low blood glucose, and the ultimate effect is that it inactivates glycogen synthase or makes it so we're not going to build glycogen, does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. We don't have enough glucose, so we're not going to store it. We're going to use it. Um, so we've talked about how different um, conditions can make our bodies act in different ways. So when we're fasting or exercising, then our glucagon or our other um, neurotransmitters, such as catecholamines, are going to activate protein kinase A via our second messenger system in camp. And then it's going to phosphorylate glycogen synthase so that um, it's, we're not going to build glycogen. Um, it's strongly inhibited by tissue glycogen content. So just think of the negative feedback. If we've got tons of glycogen, then we don't need to build more. It's going to inactivate this so we don't build more. And it's also inhibited by starvation, which also makes sense because we wouldn't have much glucose, so we don't want to build and store it. So let's look at this in a pictorial form. All right, let's start on the bottom here, okay? So in this um, graphic, instead of insulin, we're using the um, hormone and hormone slash neurotransmitter glucagon and epinephrine. So in our second messenger system, we know that um, these... Uh, hormones uh, stimulate our second messenger system or adenylcyclase, and we ultimately end up with our cyclic AMP. And the cyclic AMP activates protein kinase A. Okay, so this is going to get a little bit tricky here. Sorry, I should do a quick overview here. Um, so here in this graphic, let's look at the center part first, because I know this is kind of hard to digest. So here we have the glycogen synthase, which is active because it's in the dephosphorylated form. Here we have the glycogen synthase that's less active or inactive, and it's the phosphorylated form. So let's start on the bottom here, okay? So this is saying, how do we get it from its less active form to its more active form, right? Now the way we would do that is by a phosphatase protein. We would take the phosphate group off, right? Well, yes. But it's not just one step, uh, not just a straight-up um, phosphatase that we're going to 
so we have our uh, protein phosphatase, our phosphoprotein phosphatase one here. So yes, we can take our phosphate group off and put it back to the active group. But this phosphatase is controlled itself by another enzyme, this inhibitor one that we just talked about. And this inhibitor one is active in its phosphorylated form. So let's go back to what we were talking about before. We have our glucagon, obviously we have a low blood glucose of some sort, and in activating this protein kinase A, then we're making um, our inhibitor active. So that's tricky. We're making the inhibitor active. So when the inhibitor is active, it's going to inhibit this phosphatase from working, and we're going to keep it in the less active form, the glycogen synthase in the less active form. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense because glucagon says we have low blood glucose, so we want to keep it in the less active form. We don't want to store it because we don't have enough. So we can see we have a couple of steps here. We have this phosphatase, but then the phosphatase is regulated by this inhibitor 1. And the protein kinase A and the phosphoprotein phosphatase are the enzymes that regulate this inhibitor 1. Okay, and then now let's go to the top here. So in this process, we're moving from the active form of glycogen synthase to the inactive or less active form of glycogen synthase. So we're making, going from, yes, we should really build some glycogen to, now nah, we're not going to build some glycogen. Let's look at this. So first we have our insulin, okay? And the insulin is actually going to stop this glycogen synthase kinase from working. So insulin is saying, um, Insulin is stopping the phosphorylation of this glycogen synthase. So basically, insulin is saying, let's keep building glycogen. So that makes sense, right? But let's go to our other enzymes that are neurotransmitters, glucagon and epinephrine. They're going to produce CAMP. CAMP's going to produce protein kinase A, and it's also going to activate phosphorylase kinase. We have both of these kinases that are activated by glucagon and epinephrine. So they're going to add a phosphate group onto this and make it less active. Does that make sense? Yes, it does make sense because if we have low blood glucose, we do not want to build glycogen. I'm going to let you look at that for just one second while I check my notes. So basically, okay, and then let's look at this um, last one. With on this side. Okay, and so on this one we uh, side, we also have this um, calmagulin-dependent protein kinase, and this kinase mostly acts in the muscle cells because when we are um, using our muscle cells, it stimulates um, an influx of calcium into the cell, and that is what activates this um, calmagulin-dependent protein kinase, so that's mostly in the muscle. But either way, it's a kinase that's going to add um, a phosphate group onto this active form to make it less active. And does that make sense? If I'm exercising, is that the time I want to build glycogen? No, that's the time I want to use up the glycogen, not build the glycogen, so I want it to be inactive. So you can see that this glycogen synthase at the center here is really the important enzyme in whether we're going to build glycogen or not, but that that is controlled by many different kinases that are stimulated by many different processes, such as different in, uh, hormones or, um, or nutrients, such as calcium. So the various protein kinases are activated as a result of different intracellular signal transduction pathways responding to different hormonal and nutrient signals. So here is a much simpler version. <laughs> so um, we're just going to look at this top part here, where we have um, epinephrine or glucagon, which stimulates CAMP, which stimulates protein kinase A, which um, phosphorylate, or sorry, which, um, yes, uses a phosphate group in order to add a phosphate onto glycogen synthase and make it inactive. And again, if we have epinephrine or glucagon, we don't want to build glycogen. Makes sense. Now let's switch gears from glycogenesis, where we build glucose or glycogen, to glycogenolysis, where we break down glycogen in order to free um, glucose or glucose 6-phosphate in the muscle um, so that it can provide energy to our body.
So we would break down glycogen in a situation like um, where we were exercising or fasting or had lo low blood glucose. So our body's saying, okay, I need some uh, glucose. I'm going to go to my stores and I'm going to try to uh, break the glucose off so I can use it. Now, the major enzyme in glycogenolysis is glycogen phosphorylase. So glycogen synthase for glycogenesis, glycogen phosphorylase for glycogenolysis. And this enzyme removes a single glucose residue um, from the alpha, with that has an alpha 1 4 li linkage within the glycogen molecule. And there, with that, produces uh, glucose 1 phosphate. So that's in this reaction here. So we have our glycogen molecule. We add a phosphate um, on, and then our phosphate goes onto our glucose molecule so that we have glucose 1 uh, uh, phosphate. And then our glycogen molecule is just one. Um, glucose shorter. And we do need an active B6 in order to um, serve as a cofactor to make this reaction work. And then we keep using this glycogen phosphorylase with the alpha-1-4 linkages until we reach a branch point. Okay, and when, when we... Um, so the first, when we get to a branch point, we're going to debranch it. And basically debranching is the opposite of what we did with the branching enzyme in glycogenesis. So in reactions two and three of glycogenolysis, we have, instead of branching, we have debranching. We have a transferase that is going to move um, three to four glucose units and attach them to the end of a longer chain with an alpha-1-4 linkage. And then the... Um, Glycogen phosphorylase can come by and cleave them off. But then we also have an alpha-1,6 glucosidase that is going to hydrolyze that um, glucose that's at that branch point and has an alpha-1,6 branch point. And it's going to remove it in the form of free glucose. So, um, so once we've removed the glucose, it's in glucose 1-phosphate form. Again, we'll use the same reversible um, enzyme phosphoglucomutase in order to move the phosphate and get us to glucose 6-phosphate. And here, so, and then keep in mind here, we're left with G6P. And here's just kind of an overall um, view of what we just talked about. So here is, oops, sorry. Here's our original glycogen molecule here, okay? We have glycogen phosphorylase, so it's cleaving off each one of these little glucose molecules, and we're left with this shorter branch on the glycogen. And then we have our debranching enzyme that's going to take these three here and put them on the end of this glucose chain, so then we can just use glycogen phosphorylase to cleave them again. But we've still got this little guy that's attached with an alpha-1,6 um, linkage and so we have another part of our debranching enzyme that's able to remove that little glucose as a free glucose and then we're left with a less complex glycogen chain that we can break down okay and then in our last step of glycogenolysis when we have our g6p then we have g6 uh, phosphatase which as we know from the um word phosphatase is going to take the phosphate group off in order so that we have plain glucose. And this last step does occur in the liver and the kidney and the intestines. Um, and in that way, especially in the liver, we're able to have this free glucose uh, that can contribute to um, increasing or maintaining blood glucose levels. However, this reaction 5 does not happen in muscle cells because our muscles lack the enzyme G6-phosphatase. So if um, our glucose is left in this form of G6P, um, then it stays in the muscle cell. It can't get out of the muscle cell. It stays in the muscle cell. And therefore, the um, glucose that we get from glycogen in the muscle cell stays in the muscle cell, it can't alter blood glucose levels. And instead, it uses the G6P um, and it oxidizes it so that it can use energy for its own cell um, via the uh, glycolysis, which we'll talk about next week. So here's kind of just an overview of what we talked about. We have our glycogen, 
we have our glycogen phosphorylase, which is going to um, leave us with a glycogen with one less glucose and a gly glucose one phosphate, which is transformed into glucose six phosphate. With the phosphatase, we can then move that to glucose, which can help us, uh, which we can use to regulate our blood glucose levels. Or um, what I just added on here for your, um, or in the muscle, the G6P, it can just go through glycolysis and everything after that TCA cycle electron transport chain in order to produce energy for a muscle cell. Oh, wow, there's a lot on this slide. Okay, let's try to go through it. So I think, so there's a lot of parallels with glycogen synthase. It's just kind of a different side of the coin. So just like um, in the... Um, glycogen synthase, glycogen phosphorylase also has two forms. It also has an active form, which is always A, and it also has an inactive form, which is B. However, very tri tricky, um, for glycogen phosphorylase, the active form actually has the phosphate group, and the inactive form has no phosphate group. Um, so as makes sense, glucagon not only stops glycogen synthesis, it's gonna stimulate glycogen degradation. So it's not only gonna say, don't build more glycogen, it's gonna say, let's break down some of this glycogen so that we can get some more glucose. And it's exactly what we talked about with the glycogen synthase, that the glucagon goes, um, stimulates the dental cyclase, transforms uh, ATP to camp, um, stimulates protein kinase A, and then that this that activated um, kinase phosphorylates the inactive form to the active form. So in this case, a kinase is actually going to make it um, bring it from its inactive form to its active form. And the active form glycogen phosphorylase is breaking down glycogen. So that makes sense, right? If we have epinephrine or glucagon, we want to make glycogen phosphorylase active. We want it to break down glycogen so that we can have our glucose. Um, and then we, um, we can transform phosphorylase A, the active form, into the inactive form by removing its phosphate group um, by a phosphatase or a phos by uh, a phosphatase, yes. So glycogen phosphorylase stays in its inactive form if there's adequate ATP or uh, glucose 6-phosphate in the muscle. So let's think through that. Glycogen phosphorylase stays inactive if we have adequate energy and adequate glucose in the muscle. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense because if we have enough energy, if we have enough glucose, then we don't really need to break down our glycogen. We can just keep it as it is and store it for when we do need it. We do know that glucose, um, you could say G6P or straight up glucose, stimulates the dephosphorylation of uh, glycogen phosphorylase from its active form to its inactive form in the liver. And again, that makes sense. Same with G6P in the muscle. If we've got enough, we don't need more. And here's a nice big graphic of, it's again, just like we ha saw with glycogen synthase, but instead we have glycogen phosphorylase in, um, in the center here. So we can see that we have our, uh, start with this. So this is the less active form of glycogen phosphorylase. So this is saying, don't break down your glycogen. And this one is saying, do break down your glycogen. This is the active form. So first, let's look at these little side um, parts. So we would see, see that ATP and glucose 6-phosphate are um, going to tell this to stay, um, stay less active because it's going to say, okay, we've got enough. Stay, act, uh, stay less active. We don't need more. And then... Um, same here, so same on the other side. We have glucose, and glucose is Okay, sorry about that. Got interrupted. Okay, so let's look down um, below and above here. So 
Remember what our stimulation is here. It's glucagon and epinephrine, so low blood glucose levels, let's just say, to make it simple. Those stimulate CAMP, that stimulates protein kinase A, which adds a phosphate group onto inhibitor 1, and that makes the inhibitor active. It makes the inhibitor active. So if the inhibitor is active, then this phosphatase is going to be inhibited. It's going to be inactive. Therefore, it's not going to take the phosphate group off of this active form, and phosphorylase is going to stay active. Does that make sense? If we have low blood glucose levels, do we want to break down our glycogen? Yes, we do. We do want to break down our glycogen. So um, that makes sense. And again, this is going to be... Um, uh, glucose is going to be a negative um, feedback for this. So if we have enough glucose, then um, we don't need to break down more glycogen. And we can also see here that this inhibitor not only inhibits the phosphatase here, it's also going to inhibit the phosphatase up here. So let's go through this one. So again, we have glucagon or epinephrine stimulates CAMP, stimulates protein kinase. The kinase is going to add a phosphate on to phosphorylase kinase, okay, <laughs> which is active in its phosphorylated form. I told you this gets a little more um, complicated. But when this kinase is active, it adds a phosphate group on so that we remain active for our phosphorylase. So again, low blood glucose levels, we want our phosphorylase to be active so we break down glycogen. And we can see for this phosphorylase kinase in our, um, in our muscle that calcium is a positive stimulation for this. So remember I said when we're working our muscles, we have an influx of calcium. So I'm working, I'm working, I'm working. So my body's saying, I need some energy. Let's keep this phosphorylase active. And we can also see that this inhibitor, if it inhibits this phosphatase, then it's going to keep this kinase active and we're gonna keep our phosphorylase active. So again, it's complicated, but it makes sense. It's all about activating and inactivating enzymes through um, usually hormonal stimulation. And here's kind of a summary. This is the bottom part to the figure we saw before. So again, we have epinephrine or glucagon, stimulates CAMP, stimulates protein kinase A, making phosphorylase kinase active, which makes glycogen phosphorylase active, and glycogen is degraded. And we know that we want that, because if we have low blood glucose, we want to use our glycogen to, so we can get some energy. All right, so summary of glycogen regulation. You didn't think you'd make it through, right? <laughs> but we did. So basically, in summary, the synthesis and degradation of glycogen is regulated by the same hormonal signals. But these hormonal signals have so many actions by stimulating or, or I should say, activating or deactivating all these different kinases. Generally speaking, elevated insulin leads to glycogen synthesis. We have a lot, we want to store it. We have a lot of glucose, we want to store it. Elevated glucagon or epinephrine in the muscle results in increased glycogen degradation. I need glucose. I'm going to try to free it from my glycogen. However, um, and by, uh, glucagon acts in the liver and epinephrine acts in the liver and muscles, but um, especially in the muscles. And, of course, as a take-home message, that's a concept throughout this course, the action of phosphatases always opposes that of kinases. So what happens when some of these enzymes aren't functioning properly? Well, we get all sorts of glycogen storage diseases, and there's many different types. Um, from your reading today, we... Uh, that it discusses glycogen storage disease one and um, the mechanisms involved in that and the consequences. So generally speaking, in a glycogen storage disease, it, there's a mutation in the genes that are coding for one of these um, enzymes that is needed in glycogen metabolism. And because this enzyme is missing, glycogen often can't break down in various parts of the body, and it kind of starts to clog up your system, I guess you could think of it as. Um, it also, if you can't break down glycogen, then your body is not able to regulate your blood glucose stores as well. Um, and these are, as uh, 
class of diseases. They are quite rare, but they do really impact the individuals who have them. So I'm just going to kind of briefly go over the types of glycogen storage diseases. Um, the most common kind is type 1 von Gerke's disease, um, and it's a deficiency of G6 phosphatase activity. And so, um, again, we know that our muscles don't have the G6 phosphatase anyway, but if we don't have it in our liver, then it can't free that glucose. It can't transform it from glucose 6-phosphate to plain old glucose, which can leave the cell and help um, distribute the glucose to the rest of the body. Um, and because this glycogen, it just kind of builds and builds and builds because you can't degrade it, it actually leads to an enlargement um, in the liver or hepatomegaly. Now, because um, the individual who has it, it has this um, von Gerich's disease, can't, doesn't have all the glucose that they need um, for growth, for normal growth, they might have um, growth retardation. And because um, they can't regulate their blood glucose levels with glycogen, it can lead to hypoglycemia, and then they may um, be depending more on lipids for their energy, um, which can lead to ketoacidosis. And we'll talk about uh, ketoacidosis in, um, more in the lipid section. It is possible to survive and have this disease if someone is taking in glucose continually throughout the day so that they don't have so much that they store it up as glycogen, but they have enough so that their body is being supplied with a constant source of glucose. Next, we have Pompe's disease, and I actually did have a client with this in the hospital once, a little baby. Um, there can be, it can occur in, um, uh, to infants and, and children or in adults, and it's a defect in the alpha-1,4 glucosidase that hydrolyzes the alpha-1,4 linkages in the glycogen. So basically, again, it's just a different enzyme, but the take-home message is the same. We can't break down glycogen. And, um... A lot of times this can be fatal, a fatal disease. Um, it can result in uh, damage to the muscle fibers or to the heart muscle because, again, this is um, just glycogen is just building up, building up, and also to an accumulation of liver glycogen. We also have Pompe's disease, um, which is type 3, or sorry, type 2. Um, we also have type 3 Coriz or Forbes disease, which has um, a lack of a debranching enzyme so that that um, is the step in glycogen degradation that um, is left. So it, um, because it only lacks the debranching enzyme, we do have um, the ability to cleave those 1,4 linkages, but then when you get to those branch points, then we can't break that down. So still we have this enlargement of the liver. We still have low blood glucose because we're not able to break down the glycogen um, completely. Um, and we might have some growth retardation, but we still can get some glucose off of those alpha-1,4 linkages. So it's not quite as severe of a form of the glycogen storage diseases. We also have type 5, which is a deficiency of muscle phosphorylase. I'll let you read some of the details. Um, and individuals in, um, with this type of disease, I mean, could lead a seemingly normal life, but they cannot perform heavy, heavy exercise, um, and they also might have weak muscle weakness and cramping. But again, if they avoid the strenuous exercise, it's not a big deal. So again, this is a less severe form. And then finally, we have type 6, um, Hare's disease. And instead of the phosphorylase deficiency in the muscle, we have a phosphorylase deficiency in the liver. And here's your practice questions. So go through those and make sure that you understand the concepts. Again, you don't need to memorize every single enzyme that you saw, but memorize the big ones like the glycogen synthase and the glycogen phosphorylase and understand how they're regulated in the processes um, that they um, participate in. And that concludes the lecture for module three. And I'll look forward to talking to you next week when we are going to talk more about carbohydrate metabolism and breaking down glucose instead of building up glucose.